better than Jesus next to me is Jesus in me. And, wow, may the Holy Spirit just bless us this morning by opening up his word to us. The same God who inspired it has to open it up in order for us to benefit from it. And that's what we are seeking today. Well, your text this morning, the main text, is printed there on the song sheet. Those are the verses that I, Lord willing, seek to be elaborating upon. But I wanted to read a little more context. I'm going to read starting at verse, in, the, in chapter 10, at verse 18 through verse 15 of chapter 11. These, these are 16 verses, but the context is much bigger than this. But it'll give you the, the taste of what Paul was was confronting and dealing with here in Corinth. So that this passage that we'll be looking at has so much to say to us. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was, burdened to, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything I have kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I will continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity of those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. No wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Oh, this one more prayer. Oh, Father, open up your word to us now. We thank you for your presence among us. Make us sensitive. Give us ears to hear, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul says, oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. I, I, I've given the setting here. The Corinthians, I read a little bit more context, but the Corinthians would bear easily enough the false teachers, those who charged them, those who took money from them, those who would give them their credentials and their own accommodations and congratulations and only their audacity. can't speak this morning. Audacity, there it is. Perhaps uh, alone could be equal to their boasting, the pompous boasting. But Paul declared to them, it is not he who commends himself who is approved, but whom the Lord commends. But the Corinthians were ever ready to give ear to the false apostles, the deceitful workers who transformed themselves, quote, into ministers of righteousness after the pattern of Satan, who transformed himself into an angel of light. The Corinthians were hearing preachers who were delivering to them Another Jesus, not the Jesus Paul preached, not the Jesus that the scriptures revealed, but another Jesus. And they were to receive then a different spirit, not the comforter, not the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth, but a different spirit, a deceitful spirit. And they were presenting a different gospel, which as Paul said to the Galatians, which is no gospel at all. In fact, even if we are an angel from heaven should bring another gospel, let him be anathema, let him be damned, let him be cursed, let him go to hell. Let the angel go to hell who would bring another gospel. False teachers still plague the world. You know, traveling through Utah, just seeing Craig and Mary and seeing all the, the Mormon 
decorations throughout that state it really grieve my heart. Uh, like those who, who Paul said here, so they preach another Jesus, a demigod. And of course the JWs, they preach another Jesus. They preach one who is a created being, not the creator. And they preach a different Holy Spirit, not he who is equal to the Father. And the JWs preach a different Holy Spirit who is just but a force and not a person, even though Scripture clearly reveals he grieves, he thinks, he acts, he chooses. And it all boils down to they present a different gospel, which, as Paul said, is no gospel at all. But it's not just these kind of cults. That Paul, in fact, it's not even what Paul is speaking about. He's speaking about within the walls of the church, where the church is meeting, that there was another Jesus being preached, another spirit that they must receive that is not the spirit of God, and another gospel that was being developed among them. It can happen even to a Christian that his mind might become corrupted through the beguiling Serpent. Did you, do you realize that Eve was without any sin when her mind was corrupted and beguiled into sin? Paul is saying in, in verse 3, for I fear. That's a powerful way to, to introduce this. For I fear that lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds. He's already revealed how he knows that they are in Christ, that they've been saved, they're the temple of God, though he mentions that, that there is carnality. There, he says, I have reason to fear so that your minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Wow, that is powerful. It does happen. It can happen. False teachers, I'm dealing with that. Jim has dealt with that. This church has made a stand in our association. False teachers have come in among us, even while they have on paper all the sound doctrines of the faith. Yet false teachers are presenting another Jesus who kind of winks at sin and another spirit of toleration rather than of holiness and another gospel of another way to be saved just by saying, you're okay, I'm okay, okay? Instead of submission to the Lord God Almighty. It can happen. It was Paul's genuine fear that it would happen right there in Corinth. It had happened with Eve, and like I said, she had no sin. Peter declared it this way, he said, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped those who live in air. They allure those who have actually escaped those who live in air. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome by him, he is brought into bondage. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Paul said, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom, you have not, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit whom you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Wow. Paul made this point very clear by referring to Eve. Yes, through the beguiling position of the so-called teacher of righteousness. The same pattern that Satan pulled off in the perfection of the Garden of Eden with a sinless being is how he operates today. And I truly could elaborate on this, but I've got something that the Lord laid on my heart to share today. So I'm going to have to forego it except to, to say this. Doctrine matters. It matters that we preach the correct Jesus, that we receive the right spirit, that we have the true gospel. It matters that we're not tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine. It matters greatly. And how beguiling it is with a show of concern and intellectual superiority that false teachers come even as Satan came, as a superior intellectual, more caring than most 
would as he, so to speak, put his arm around Eve and said, Did God really say you cannot eat from this tree? Planting a doubt in the motive of God? Why he'd say no within the heart of Eve? Did he really say that? Has God not said every tree is yours? And now he's saying you can't? Does he have some motive, some ulterior motive that you just have never really realized that it's not really your best interest, Eve? Why, he knows your eyes will be opened. You'll be like him. He doesn't want that. He likes that title. He, you'll be like God. You'll know good from evil. What a nice thing it is to have a half-truth. Yes, they ate and they knew God was good and they were evil. Half-truths are some of the worst lies that have ever been told. They're not the worst lies. You'll know good from evil then. And he presented it as a desirable food, pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise. It was beguiling. You know, the simplicity of Christ was, do not eat from the tree lest you die. That's simple. That's plain. But the beguiling is a lot of words in there. The beguiling is a lot of planting doubt here, planting doubt here, building on a foundation of nothing as if you were building on the rock of Gibraltar to make your next point, bit by bit, until it happened, pardon the pun, and Eve bit. Wow. Through a complicated web of words, Christian churches fall to false teachers. Through a complicated web of words, Adam and Eve sinned through a complicated system of arguments and half-truths and emphasizing a, a look of love that is void of what real love is. They present a message that's so convoluted that people lose sight of the simplicity that's in Christ. The Corinthians entertaining these false brothers forced Paul in his love for their souls to boast, just like they had been boasting and getting the attention. Okay, you want to boast? I'm going to boast on the same game field that you play on. Being ready, Paul was to cast out everything that dared to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. He said, I'm going to be a fool in boasting. It's not what he wanted to do. It's what he needed to do to rescue them out of the fire here. May God, the Holy Spirit, have the attention of each of us this morning in order that he might deliver us from the craftiness of the enemy because the craftiness of the enemy has many ways to beguile us, many ways to delude, many ways to just get our focus off of the simplicity that's in Christ so that Christians have lived in terror of God. Christians have lived wondering if this is wrong or that is wrong. Do not touch, do not taste, self-neglect of the body, thinking it's somehow improving their soul, all manner of beguiling instead of the simplicity that's in Christ. So let each of us say, oh, dear Heavenly Father, open the eyes of my understanding, open my ears to hear what the Spirit says, because our enemy is great and cruel, but greater still is the strong one who can bind him. Amen. Amen. Well, let's begin through considering verse 3 now. That was the intro. That's to, to bring you into the text here. This is what Paul was dealing with. And he says, But I fear lest somehow as the servant deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And right here, i got to state right at the, the, the front here, that there's a difference in, in various translations regarding uh, how to translate the, uh, the Greek preposition ace. It's uh, epsilon, th just three letters, epsilon, yoda, and sigma together. It's a preposition ace. It can be translated either as in, as it is in our text, or by the, the preposition towards, and so that it, it can be rendered, the last line there, your minds may be corrupted from the, simplicity, from the simplicity that is in Christ, or it can be translated, your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is toward Christ. Now, if the word is translated as in Christ, it emphasizes the holy simplicity of the faith in Christ that we are to alone stand in, trusting in the word, period. What a place for the translators to find themselves because if it's translated as toward, it emphasizes the holy simplicity of our faith in Christ to trust him only toward him, his word alone. Now, they both end up in the same place. 
in a roundabout way. But what, again, what a place for the translators to find themselves in. Who could find fault with either translation, either as in or toward? And yet they do emphasize different things. Now, if I had to choose, I believe I would lead towards the text translated as in. For it seems so perfectly to me to agree with the context, comparing the craftiness of the beguiling serpent with the simplicity that's in the Christ. The, the duplicity of the devil and the simplicity in Christ. It just seems to go so much, it in just seems so to fit in there so well. But certainly the text also supports the need for a simplicit, a simplicit trust in Christ, a simple trust and faith in him. But more to the point, I see no need to quibble over the correct English word. I mean, people that do English translations, they got to quibble over it because they have to give a translation. But let's just remember that the Holy Spirit didn't give this to Paul in English. He gave it to him in Greek. And I don't see why we have to sacrifice one truth for the other. Both are fully supported in Scripture. That the simplicity that's in Christ, and simple does not mean not much to it. And it speaks about, about straightforwardness. Purity, even power. Did you know that it's the purest water that conceals the greatest depth? Have you ever looked into really clear water? I remember going to Hawaii and seeing really clear water. And wow, it's not very deep. And boom, boom, boom. Yes, it is. Really clear water is deceiving. Simplicity is deceiving. People go over their heads when they look into a clear lake and they get a loop because simplicity and purity, there's, it's not... <laughs> Uh, we're, we're talking about the simplicity of Christ. We're talking about that which is fathomless. It's not an insult to speak about simplicity in Christ. But simplicity toward Christ is so greatly needed, is it not? Oh, what complicated views people have looking for some sort of Bible code, some sort of hidden information somewhere in the Bible that reveals what God really has going on for us. When God is so straightforward, when God couldn't be more careful, unless you become like little children, you'll never even enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, Lord willing, before the service closes, I want to focus also on taking the preposition and the emphasis it gives to the text by having it the simplicity that is toward Christ. But I want to focus now upon the simplicity that is in Christ. And certainly the simplicity in Christ can be seen to contrast the beguiling serpent of old, that murderer of the human race so that they ended up dying, the devil. There was nothing unclear about the command of God. Simplicity, straightforwardness, but the devil, insinuation, bold-faced lie, half-truth, complex arguing, building upon a foundation he hasn't had established yet. Has God not said? You shall not eat from every tree in the garden. You will not surely die. Even bold-faced lies he mixes in there. All manner of beguiling. Sin is complicated. And it will always take you farther and mess you up more than you are ever willing to go. Ask blind Samson about that. The cost is always higher then you're willing to pay, then the pleasure, the consequence always more costly than obedience ever would have been. Satan is the rationalizer, tempting and pushing away from the simplicity of, cross, of Christ. And then once he's gotten you to bite, blaming you, why did you do that? You, that you disobeyed God. That is your devil who is after your soul. If he has gotten you, his head can still be crushed underneath your foot. Confess your trespass to the Lord. Tell him what you've done, how you've bought the lie, how you have bit. For he came at great cost. How can I even call it great cost? At infinite cost. The infinite person of, the, of Christ. Only God is infinite. Fully God. And yet fully man to take my place under the wrath of God. To crush Satan's head under your foot. Determined to go on and sin no more. The complication of your sin is nothing to the infinite sacrifice to what God has planned. He has planned sacrifice in paradise, as a song says, in the plans that he's made for us. Determined to sin no more and let the complication be God's to handle because he's infinite and there's no problem for him to handle it. 
He has plumbed the depths of all of sin's power and destroyed it, conquered it. At great cost to himself, yes, but his heel was struck, but he crushed Satan's head. This I say, the great God has masterfully given his word to us, his truth, in simplicity. Some people sometimes look at preachers I know and they say, oh, you know the word of God so well, it's just, you know, I, I don't know very well. And, you know, it just isn't that way, is it? It's not how deep someone knows it. It's the intimate relationship they have from God, with God from what they have. What fellowship, what joy, what delight I have with each one of my grandchildren. But they're not at my intellectual ability. And yet I've met people of my intellectual ability or maybe even more. Well, I couldn't have them. Definitely there's more. <laughs> well, I couldn't care to have any time of day to spend with them. It is not that it takes a lot of knowledge to be saved. It takes very little knowledge to be saved by even a child. It takes very little knowledge to be saved because it's so straightforward, the simplicity in Christ, even though it's as deep as can be. But it does take all of the heart. I love my dad. I would never describe my dad as a theologian, but as a man of simple faith and trust and looking to God. Is that something you can say? That's the simplicity that we're to have in Christ, that we can have in Christ, that Christ has offered to us. This I say, the great and powerful and awesome Lord God has given us unfathomable depths simply in this. Now, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Think about how complicated it was for Satan to get Eve to bite. A lot of words, a lot of fast talking, and he finally got it. And yet, how is all that undone? Well, what did Satan accomplish? He got them to disbelieve God. So God does an amazing work so that now all man has to do is believe him again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. In fact, the very point where Satan first attacked the human race is the very point from which you will come and crush the serpent's head from the seed of the woman. His redemption is greater than the craftiness of the devil. Come to the simplicity that's in Christ. Now, one commentary I read against, uh, or warning against, rather, taking simple and applying that to the gospel. And, and I, I understood his point, uh, but I felt like he labored somewhat in vain when he made it because, you know, you're saying things that are obvious. It, we're, not, we had, we're not confusing simple with simple-mindedness. And, you know, I even hate the fact that we say simple-mindedness as if that's a stupid thing. The, the world ruined, has ruined the word simple. Simple means pure. It means, it means straightforward. In fact, the literal understand is, is without a fold in it. It's the real thing. And just like they've ruined the word love, the world's ruined the word love, and love is a wonderful word, but it can't be separated from sacrifice. Instead, it's joined to the word greed and lust. So it's, we don't have to think, it, nobody understands that, the, some, the, at least not here, I'm sure, the simplicity that's in Christ as being something shallow. Again, the purer something is, the more depth it conceals. My friend and Yuji, my friend Yuji and Yuji, my friend Yuji in Japan is what I meant to say. Before he got saved and I would talk to him about the gospel of Jesus Christ, quite a language barrier. I draw a little stick figure, a stick figure across, and then sin drawn on it, and God put all this in. I'm telling him the simple gospel, the simplicity, I should say, of the gospel, because that's better understood than saying the simple gospel because the word's been so perverted. But the simplicity of the gospel, Yuji said, Christianity can't be true. It's too simple. <laughs> yes, even Yuji could understand the gospel. And he told me about the complicated religion of Buddha until he was confused. <laughs> and he finally came and he said, you're right. Jesus Christ is alive and Buddha is dead. And he surrendered to Jesus Christ. He's walking with the Lord to this day. The simplicity that's in Christ means pride must surrender to it. The simplicity means you must come like a child or you're not even going to enter in. 
It doesn't speak of shallowness in the least. But we are not just to trust him at the start, for all of his promises are yes and amen. We are to continue to be careful not to have our minds corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. It can happen. It happened to the Galatians. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed, is crucified. God took care of it all. And now you're trying to be perfected in the flesh after having begun in the spirit. It can happen, Christians. Our minds can become corrupted from the simplicity that's in God. Praise God. You don't have to be a theologian to walk with Jesus Christ, to have fellowship with him, to know him, to be loved by him and to love him. Now I want to get to, in a moment here, speaking about the simplicity toward Christ. I've spoken about the simplicity in Christ. And I do want to get to that, but before I do that, I hope, Lord William, that I'll get to that before I close, but I want to get for a moment to verse 4 because this is the corruption. This is what the corruption was that the Corinthians were facing. This is the corruption that you and I face from Satan, from false teachers, and even from our own mixed up mind when we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ, clearly portrayed as crucified, didn't matter how big I've messed up, nothing's gonna touch infinite sacrifice. Oh, the simplicity that's in Christ, fully God and fully man, infinite and yet my true substitute. Verse 4 says, For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. That's, that's quite an indictment. What a slap in the face. Because I don't believe it's just slapping the Corinthians in the face. I, I think that's something that I've got to really hear. How shall your mind become corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ? By blinding you to the real Jesus. The cults, again, they preach a different Jesus. We all understand that. This we may all understand very well in this room and yet still be in danger of preaching or accepting or focusing on another Jesus than the Jesus here in Scripture. Never lose sight of the real Jesus. Jesus. You know, it's Jesus who reveals God to us, period. All of our comfort about our fears, all of our comfort about a holy God and we who have sinned and how could that ever come together, all of that is answered in Jesus. All the information we need to know about if he's a good God or not is what is, what is revealed in the real Jesus. He is the word of God who was with God and became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Seeing him, we see God, Jesus said. No one reveals the Father, he said, but the Son, the Son who has seen him, who knows him intimately, face to face in the Greek. Equality, one and the same, and yet, without dividing, without scrambling the substance, neither, phew, blah, 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 this is going to get difficult, i got to be careful, I'm going to spit out too many words and choke. Persons, but one substance, the doctrine of the Trinity. He reveals the divine nature. He reveals God. Does he not? What does the Bible said, say? He is the image, Paul said in Colossians 15, he's the image of the invisible God. God would not allow Israelites to Make any, go, any image to God, not even the true God. First two commandments. The first one, you'll have no other God, and you won't make an image to God. And this is what I think God is like. The only image of God is the one that God has brought before our eyes. He is the image of the invisible God, Paul said. Paul also said, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, who God really is. And he adds these words, in the face of Jesus Christ. That's how we know God. I love how it says it in, in Hebrews. I didn't even put that one in here. Oh, this is one of my favorites. The first chapter. Who?
who being the brightness of his glory, Jesus being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. Isn't that awesome? If I keep the real Jesus and not another Jesus, I see who God is. Look at how Jesus dealt with a woman caught in adultery. That's how God feels about me. Look how Jesus dealt with a woman at the well. Look how Jesus dealt with a leper and reached out and hugged him. Look how he dealt with Mary and Martha. Martha and Saul, I should say. Both of them getting off track, trying to please God in different extremes, but trying to please God in all their labor. And how does he speak to them? And thunder and lightning, no, but in what is used in scripture to be very tender, repeating the name twice. Martha, Martha, Saul, Saul. That's the God that Jesus has revealed. If I see who Jesus is, I know that's how God sees me. Let not your heart be troubled, he said. You believe in God, believe also in me. He said, how can... How can you say, show us the Father? He said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show me the Father? He is the image of the invisible God. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared him, neither dividing the substance nor confounding the persons. There's the words I was trying to spit out that I was choking on. How beautiful it has been captured in, in the Christian creed. But you become worried by corrupting your mind through the beguiling serpent, the devil, that God does not really care about you, that he has some sort of ulterior motive, that he's not really dealing with you in simplicity, that he's kind of trying to tempt you to, just to see if you'll fall. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he has no delight in tempting you, only good things from God, no, from God, no variance or shadow of turning. He is always consistent, always the same. There is no duplicity in God. He cannot and will not be tempted or tempt with evil. It is the very same Jesus who reveals God that I've got to keep in mind and not another, or I'm going to have my mind corrupted from the simplicity that's in the Christian faith. Focus on him and your mind will be protected from the corruption of the beguiling serpent who seeks to bring confusion in your life likewise do not receive another spirit i was touched as bob prayed about the comforter amen sent to help us to guide us into all truth but other spirits what do they do but they lead us into more confusion and more bondage the spirit of god that we receive always glorifies jesus opens up his words, we recognize the depth and yet the simplicity of the truth of the gospel that sets us free. The Spirit of God always not only glorifies Jesus, but he conforms us into the image of his Son. He's making us into this, this image. And the Holy Spirit is always contrary to sinful flesh while longing to deliver it. That we become the temple of God, that he dwell there. Though he can be personally insulted, yet the Bible speaks of not grieving the Holy Spirit. That speaks of his love. Only love grieves. Only grieving is hurting. Only true love hurts. Don't receive another spirit. If the spirit that you've received in your religion doesn't line up with the person of Jesus Christ, you've received a different, another spirit. Don't blame something on the Holy Spirit that you could never blame on Jesus. There's a lot of groups that have done that. Do not receive another spirit, but the comforter, the guide into all truth. For it will defeat that lying spirit who speaks his native tongue when he opens his mouth of lying. Likewise, do not embrace another gospel. And this is the one that I think most people end up ultimately falling prey to. I mean, I think the others are true, but another gospel, which, again, as Paul said, is no gospel at all. Again, oh, foolish Galatians, 
Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed among you as crucified, taking care of all of it? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? I could say that to myself, sadly, at times. I've begun in the Spirit, but now I'm going to be perfected in the flesh. And I may do all sorts of foolish things which are no value against the indulgence of the flesh, as Paul said in Colossians, the second chapter. Simplicity of the gospel. Yes, not simple-mindedness, as people would say, but the simplicity of no hidden agendas, no Bible code, no information. You've got to read between the lines to find out what God really thinks about you. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. It is the beguiling lies of the enemy who seeks in one way or another to enslave you and to corrupt your mind. Paul wrote, beware. This is to the Colossians. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Amen. He said to the Colossians also, these things have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. It is time to put everything, even your failures, especially your failures, I should say, under the precious blood of Christ, remembering the simplicity that is in Christ who was clearly betrayed among you as crucified, and you must never forget it. Hear the free offer of the gospel, which people, Satan, and maybe even ourselves pervert. What beautiful simplicity, in spite of the complicated messes we make. Isaiah 118, come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And the spirit and the bride say, Revelation 22, 17, come and let him who hears say, come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. R.S. Candlish wrote, I love this quote. Satan puts forth all his subtlety to beguile. How many reasons for doubt and unbelief does he contrive to set up against God's one reason for believing? It may be, Satan tells us, that you have committed the unpardonable sin. Or perhaps you are convinced enough of your or perhaps you are not convinced enough of your sin, or sorry enough for it, or perhaps you are not repenting, believing, praying aright. But it is upon no maybe. That the, that the blessed Lord invites you to commit your soul to him. He has but one word to you. Let no subtlety of Satan corrupt your minds from the simplicity that is in the gospel offer of a free, a full, a present salvation. And all God's people said, amen. The gospel that starts with the Father sending out the Son, that reveals we have died in Christ to our sin and raised into new life in him, our identity in Christ as our substitute. Oh, we come to the final point now of what I said I hope to get to before we close. And that is if we take the preposition instead of as the word in and make it the word toward Christ. Addressing the simplicity in us toward Christ. People who consume themselves with many things are in grave danger of missing the one thing needed. Complicated lives, busy lives are in danger of missing the one thing needed, the simplicity they need, the single-mindedness, as Jesus said. How I love the words of our Lord to Martha regarding her own distractions with many things while regarding Mary's choice to be at the Savior's feet. And he said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and 
Mary has chosen that good part. Praise God, I love this next line. Which will not be taken away from her. You choose simplicity toward Christ and it will not be taken away from you. Are you choosing that good part that will not be taken away from you? Are you consumed with many things that really don't matter? How is your simplicity toward Christ? Do you wait on him in the morning to hear his voice or to get your religious things out of the way so you can get to your day? What occupies the best of you? Are your priorities more for building for this world, this life, or for eternity? Is it really the cross before you? Is your aim to hear from Jesus more than anything else? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. David was a man after God's own heart. And even though he had a kingdom to run and enemies to fight and people to protect and met with leaders of other nations, hear his prayer of simplicity from Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is not haughty nor my eyes lofty, neither do I concern myself with great matters nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. That simplicity toward Christ. Do you regularly through this hectic world calm and quiet your soul like a weaned child with its mother? Is your response one of simplicity towards Christ or is it a complicated issue with you to be a Christian? Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. It is time to find rest for your soul like a weaned child with his mother. Jesus said in Revelation, the second chapter, to the church at Thyatira regarding those who, quote, have not known the so-called depths of Satan, as they call them. He says, I will put on you no other burden. Just hold fast what you have. To learn the other so-called secrets. To listen to the beguiling serpent. The depths of Satan. The reasonings of Satan. The arguments. The half-truths. Is to have a burden put on you. But to those who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come. That's simplicity toward Christ. Satan puts burdens on those who seek to learn to be the beguiling arguments. Fresh on my heart, like I've mentioned, is my dad's passing. And I'm so grateful to know where he is and that he trusted Jesus in life and in death. And I've come to greatly admire my dad's life. Paul instructed the believers in Thessalonica to love one another and also to aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, and about walking properly towards those who are outside. And he wrote to the Ephesians that they are to be working with their hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. And he wrote that we should be praying so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. That's simplicity toward Christ. Those things I've witnessed in my dad, including his laboring so that he had something to give to others. Very generous man. And my mom generous as well. I tell you, my dad aspired to lead a quiet life. And I have seen him mind his own business, work with his own hands, live properly to those who are outside, and giving to him who has need as he lived a peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Paul declared, for our boasting is this. The testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. We read in Acts that beautiful time when the church was born, so continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. This world is just too complicated. It is hopeless for us to ever try to outdo this beguiling world under, that lies under, the, lies under the sway of the wicked one. But let us have simplicity towards Christ, for we are to be as wise as serpents, but as simple as doves. 
This world is not just complicated, it is hopeless. Let our obedience to Christ be well known as we hear this text, as I wrap this up. Romans 16, 18 through 19. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. <laughs> that beguiling serpent. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Shall we then conclude with this? Keep it simple. And say, and keep saying it until it consumes your life. Jesus loves me. This I know. And soon you'll be adding, and I love him because he first loved me. And all God's people said, amen. You know, when you're the only one up here, there's nowhere to hide after you preach. And sometimes that's exactly what you want to do, and you want something to close the service. But I'm the only one up here, I realize. Let's just close with a, a time of silent prayer. Let's do business with God, any business that we might need to make. Maybe the Spirit of God has shown us that we've been living a complicated life and missing out on the simplicity that's in Christ. Let's just take a little bit of time and I'll close this with a song.